Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. For the pre-interview section of this show, I would like to highlight a wonderful book on aquascaping called Sunken Gardens by Karen Randall. Before I talk about my impressions, here is a brief description of this book. Sunken Gardens is packed with everything you need to plan, design, and maintain a planted freshwater aquarium. Karen Randall shares her years of expertise and makes this enchanting hobby accessible to everyone. You'll learn everything from the biology of aquatic plants and basic aquarium chemistry to tank maintenance and troubleshooting. Plant profiles highlight the best options for a range of tank situations, and a chapter devoted to aquascaping styles provides basic design principles and inspiring examples. With hundreds of color photographs and clear, reliable advice, Sunken Gardens is an essential introduction to a fascinating pastime. So I can say that from my personal experience, this book lives up to that description. Not only is the content incredibly informative, but the large color photos in this book are stunning and quite prolific. This is a book that you can go back to time and time again for reference, but also keep on display as a coffee table book. I'm sure that guests to your home will go cover to cover simply looking at the beautiful pictures. I can't recommend this book enough, and for the price, it is a no-brainer to add to your library. Before we get on to the interview, I would like to thank everyone who has subscribed, liked, or is following this podcast. If you aren't already doing so, like and follow the Aquarius Podcast Facebook page as well. It is fantastic to see that so many people are enjoying the podcast. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Wednesday, April 4th, 2018. My guest today is Eric Martins. Eric is the founder and CEO of Disco Bee, an online retailer of premium supplies and accessories for keeping freshwater dwarf shrimp, not to mention some fantastic swag. Tonight, he and I are going to talk about shrimp. So Eric, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Hey, Randy. Uh, thanks for having me. It's going to have a good time tonight. Let's, uh, let's get into it here. Yeah, absolutely. So to kick it off, um, let's get started with, you know, how did you start keeping um, fish or shrimp in glass boxes? So what's, uh, what's, your, or, what's your origin story? Uh, when I was a kid, my dad always had saltwater tanks. And, you know, as I finally got to be the age where he felt I was responsible enough to take care of my own, he, you know, got me a small tank. And I, I started keeping a few little simple goldfish. And it was just coincidental around the same time. I think it was like third grade, I'm guessing, where uh, as a school project, the teacher had us bring in a fishbowl and we kept a, a fish in the in the classroom. Um, of course, everybody got like fancy goldfish at the time because that was the thing to do. And it just blew up from there. You know, I, and when I finally got to be the age of where I could buy my own stuff, you know, I started investing and learning and, and getting into it more. And after college, um, after college, I really, you know, you finally get your own place and you can really do the way you wanted to. I got a huge tank like everybody does when they first get fish tanks. They get this huge giant thing. I ended up with a, like a 120, I believe it was back in the day. And my favorite fish still to this day is clown loaches. So I always had a huge school of clown loaches and I love clown loaches. I just think they're such a character of, of a fish. And they're all they sit in the front and they look at you and you can watch them staring at you all day. It's a good time. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on the clown loaches. Um, they are, they're, they're a fish. I'm not keeping them right now, but I did have them in the past. Um, and I hope that sometime in the near future, uh, not in a huge rush to get them, but I hope that sometime in the future I can have clown loaches again because they are, they are a really cool uh, fish. And they're, and they're the ones that like, they, they get me when I go into a fish store and I see clown loaches um, and I will forget that they like to kind of flop over on their side and play dead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, a couple times I've, I've asked the fish store attendant, like, Hey, I, I, is that clown loach? Is he okay? Or is he playing dead? And sure enough, like every time it's, you know, the clown loach is just playing dead. He's alive. He's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're goofy fish. Especially as they get bigger. We, and that 120 I had, I had a school, about eight of them, and they were all like six to eight inches big, and they would just line up in a row and lean over on each other. It yeah. was really cool. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. Like, you don't really see them very often when they get that big, but um, right. in, in Sacramento, it was Capital Aquarium, which was just this um, kind of a cornerstone of the hobby down in downtown Sacramento. Wonderful store. Um, I loved going in there. They had this huge waterfall koi pond, um, but they had, you know, one of the, the your standard massive 300 gallon or whatever plus tank of, you know, all of like the plecos and all the fish that got too big for a home aquarium. And so people would, yeah, people brought them back. Yeah. In people and... brought them back in and they had, you know, they would have massive clown loaches in there. So, you know, you see these little guys in the store and, and you think they're cute, but you know, as long as you take care of them, and as they grow, I mean, they can get they can get massive. Yeah, 
college is going to get huge, huge. But I think they develop more character as they get older because they, they don't swim around as much. They kind of just become a stable fish that just chills in the front. Yeah, I mean, I only kept mine for, I think I had mine for two or three years. And then when I moved, I had to break down the tanks. And I ended up, you know, just getting, not not, not getting rid of them. I don't think that's the right word, but making sure they went to a good keeper um, in the local area. And so, you know, I found somebody on Craigslist. So unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to really see them um, shine or, you know, to have them to get to that length. But, but yeah, definitely that's something I want to have. Uh, clown loaches, again, uh, have them for the long term and, and just see how big I can get them and, yeah. and just see all the, the silly antics that they can get into. That's what, that's what I ended up having to do. I was part of a loach forum. I think it was like loaches online or something. And I found a guy that had an even bigger tank and he, I just donated it to him and he took them and it was great. I was happy for them. Yeah. Very nice. All right. So let, let's talk about, um, this, uh, so, you know, you're, Post post uh, college, you've got your 120 gallon tank. Um, you know, maybe you've got a, a tank or two extra on the side. So I guess how did the you, how did you then get into um, keeping of the freshwater shrimp? Um, so sometimes later, I guess I moved around quite a bit after college, finding different jobs. I always had like a small little tank, and then I never really got into fish again because I just had like a you know a 20 gallon fancy planted tank, and I started getting more and more into planted tanks. And then, and then I started seeing people were like keeping a mono shrimp and things in there, and, and it just snowballed from there. Like I kept a mono shrimp, and then I became more interested in a shrimp, and then, you know, I focused less on the on the planted tank and more on the actual shrimp themselves, and it just snowballed. And I and I and at the time there wasn't really much shrimp keeping in the U.S. It was pretty much just keeping a monos just for decoration. With the with the added benefit that they're helping to uh, knock down some of that algae, if uh, you're letting that get out of control, I think a lot of it too is people keep those beautiful like scape tanks, and they want something that looks a little bit more natural. And the shrimp is just you know part of that. Yeah, they're definitely cool critters. Um, so then, all right, so now you're you're keeping shrimp. Um, so then, how does it transition into you know the I guess what's the beginnings then of of the disco beer, or what was the you know kind of in, interim step? I was selling, like we were all, all us older school guys in the U.S. were on uh, one forum, really. It was the only place to go in the U.S. And I was selling a lot of the plants that I was growing to fund my purchases of shrimp and shrimp products at the time. And shrimp products back then were, you know, you were lucky if you knew somebody who lived in Taiwan and would send you some things. There was no other real products. People were using ADA soil, which has been around for a long time, because that was the only soil at the time that lowered your pH. And then the only mineralizer we're, we were using for GH was a, sick, uh, a formula for cichlids. And that was it. That's all we had. Other, other, if you were lucky, you knew somebody who could send you some stuff from Taiwan. So that's what it started. I started buying bigger, bigger orders to um, supply all my local friends at our local fish club. And then it just snowballed. And now here I am. Nice. And so what year would you say that you, you kind of started this bulk purchase to supply your, your, uh, your I, friends? And like it started to get serious and probably like 2010 where it got to be a point where I was like, hmm, this can go somewhere. And so at the time, was that just, you know, Eric's um, Shrimp Supply Distribution Company, <laughs> LLC? Or like the... it, was just, it was just, you know, selling to my friends. Like I would buy it and then we'd all split up the shipping and that was it. And I'd sell it. I wouldn't really make any money on it still to this day. It's really not that much money in selling products, but I was just supplying my friends and that's how it started. And that's how it started on the forum too. I just was the person who started supplying people. I'm curious, is that forum still around? And can you mention that forum by name? Uh, it is, uh, it got bought out by another forum owner and then they kind of clamped down on outside sales. So ah. everybody just kind of migrated away from that forum. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So th that shall be the forum that shall not be named. A lot of people will know what I'm talking about when they hear this. <laughs> gotcha. All right. So then, uh, so then, I guess, how did you then brand it as Disco B? Um, the name actually came up because my girlfriend, she travels to Taiwan to visit her family sometimes, and and I had always known that shrimp were in Tai and and Tai, sorry, Taiwan, and so I asked her, I'm like, go look at, go check out these shops and get me some stuff because she was there. I'm like, just buy me some stuff while you're there. It's going to be cheaper than sending it. And she went to the shops and she saw all these, you know, Taiwan setups in person. And she came back with like the shrimp fever and we started a business together. 
and the disco part of the uh, cause, so I, I get the Taiwan B aspect of it. Uh, so where does the disco portion come into it? So it's kind of a, a funny play on when the shrimp are flying when when a female molts and she releases pheromones into the water. The males swim all around trying to find her, and everybody calls that dancing. So we kind of played on that with disco. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm not nearly as versed in the uh, in the shrimp knowledge as I would like to be, but you know, talking with uh, with Eric Lucas and now talking with yourself, and uh, you know, being welcomed onto the the USA uh, Freshwater Shrimp and Plants Facebook group. Which, if you're listening to this and you're not a member, um, you'll want to go over there and, and join that group. You guys have a lot of really good content, a lot of really good information to help you be a uh, a more informed we're shrimp the, keeper. We're the biggest source of knowledge in the USA, probably that group. It has all the old timers are part of it. You know, me and Eric Lucas have known each other since who knows when, way back we go, you know, and all the guys who are all vendors now are probably most of the old school guys who knew all this stuff back then and who are basically sharing their knowledge in a way to progress the hobby. I mean, there's a couple of websites that have been around for 10 years, which is crazy to me at this point. Yeah, that that is definitely a uh, a long time out there. And so... Uh, in your experience, I mean, did you um, have you always kept the Caradina variety, or have you also kept the the Neo Caradinas as well? I've had I've always I went straight to the Caradina. I always like my first dwarf shrimp, other than a mono of my planet tank were crystal red shrimp, and I've only had one tank of Neos, and that was in an office tank, and I was just like I just threw some in there so people could see it, and I didn't want to spend much money on that tank, but I've always just Caradina, and you know. Back five years, six years ago, Caradina were quite expensive. Now they're almost the same price as Neos. It's hard to – there's this weird stigma about beginners should jump straight into Neos, and it's really hard for me to say that anymore, but based on the price of Caradina now is so similar to Neos. It's almost the same, and, and I just think there's so much better info out there for beginners to jump into Caradina than there is for – Neo Caradina. A lot of people, there's a lot of bad info around Neo Caradina. And I just, I have a personal opinion that you don't really learn as much starting with Neo Caradina as if you were to just jump right into Caradina. So you want to take the, take the training wheels off and just jump straight on the bike and go for it. Yeah. I mean, they're basically the similar price nowadays. And I think you learn more and you learn faster because the basic requirements for Caradina are like hard set in stone. Versus Neo Caradina, there's just everybody has a different opinion on how to do it. And a lot of people like to throw around the term tap water. But for example, my tap water is probably extremely different than your tap water. So if we were both to say use tap water, who's the one that's right and who's the one that's wrong? It, tap water is this, people just seem to think that Neo Caradina and tap water go hand in hand. And tap water is just so varied across the U.S. Yeah, good points. I mean, uh, to prep for this uh, interview, you know, I pulled up an article um, because, you know, the the Caradinas and especially like the Taiwan bees and, and just the, the mm -hmm. bee shrimp in general, um, I wanted to have a better understanding of it before we had our conversation. And one of the articles or one of the first returns that came up was um, a featured article, Tropical Fish, um, uh, T TFH Magazine. Um, you know, the t titled The Latest Buzz, Freshwater Bee Shrimp. And unfortunately, it's from January of 2012. And so obviously mm -hmm. right now we're in 2018, so six years later. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, there's probably a lot of truths in this article. But, you know, they definitely, mm -hmm. you know, they definitely do say stay away from the, uh, from the Caradina, start with the Neo Caradina. And I think one of the things that they talk about that may change things is that the more people that domestically breed them and we're importing less and less directly from Taiwan, then that should make the stock more robust and also help bring the price down. So we've now Absolutely. been able to jump into the time machine. And now it sounds like what you're telling me actually has come to fruition. And, you know, six or so years later, you know, you can now comfortably, you know, go out and source, assuming it's local and you're not importing, um, which we could probably talk about later, you know, uh, get from somebody in your area, possibly at your fish club. So again, there's my plug, join your local fish club, find somebody yeah, breeding, <laughs> find yep. somebody breeding Caradinas. Um, and that way, you know, you, you know that they're conditioned to your water, or at least they're used to your water, um, and they're going to be a lot more hardy, right? Mm -hmm. So very. But cool. even still, like the the basic requirements, the like the things that are set in stone for Caradina are are RO water, which is 
I would say is across the board, fish, saltwater, neo caridina, caridina, tigers, whatever you want to get into, I think you should always start with our water because you, you, you know what you're starting with. Versus if I go test my water, my tap water today, and then in a week from now I test the tap water again, I don't, it could be completely different. And I don't know what my city's putting in the water every day. Yeah, fair enough. I, I think we are, um, when I say we being the, the people in the Pacific Northwest and the Seattle area, we have really, really soft water to begin with. So I think maybe I'm, right, which is, <laughs> I'm a little you, lucky. You, <laughs> you, you could probably do Caradina with your tap water because you probably have really great soft tap, tap water already, meaning soft water meaning low pH, low GH, low KH, low TDS. Great starting point for, for Caradina. So let's talk about RO water then. There, yeah, sure. So yeah, um, so let's say I'm somewhere in the Midwest or I'm in Texas and it's you know limestone rock and just super mm-hmm. hard water. So um, I, I'm looking at these posters. I'm actually literally looking at these posters that show the different uh, variants and and how the tigers branch off into black and blue tigers and the crystals mm-hmm. go mm-hmm. into the crystals in Taiwan. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at that right now. And these are obviously gorgeous, gorgeous shrimp. Um, I want to keep them, but I've got super hard water, and just this, just hearing RO, just hearing reverse osmosis, that sounds expensive, and that sounds hard, and I, you know, I've got a family, I don't have time for this, but I really want them, so I guess, um, is it as difficult as I'm alluding to, uh, to, to have RO water, and then to keep a tank or two of these Caradina shrimp? Absolutely not. I, for years... Um, because we live in LA and we rent a we rent an apartment at the time, we couldn't have an RO unit. So for years, I would lug five gallon jugs down to the grocery store and use the glacier machine out front to buy RO water. And that's how I did it for years. Nice. And, and at about twenty five and twenty five yeah. cents a a gallon, right? I mean, is that still kind of the going rate for uh for those machines? Roughly, yeah. It's, I think it's thirty five in LA, but yeah, twenty five to thirty five cents a gallon is not too bad, especially. Maybe your initial setup of a tank, it might be a little bit of, of an investment. And even then, what is it, $10 maybe? Because nobody gets huge shrimp tanks. Shrimp tank, a perfect shrimp tank is around 10 gallons. Mm-hmm. So you're still under $10 filling up a 10-gallon tank. And then you're only top, you're doing like 15, 20% water change once a week. That's not much. So buying an RO unit, yes, is expensive up front. But if you're like us who breed a lot, it pays off in the long run because I'm not lugging water around that I can get it anytime I want and I have it to ready. I can do a water change at any time, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're just a person who keeps one or two small tanks, a couple five gallon buckets of RO, it's easy to do. Yeah, that's, you know, that's really, really good. And I think that almost everywhere I've been in the States um, in my travels for work or for just being on vacation, I want to say, you know, one in every other, um, you know, strip mall or, or grocery store parking lot has one of those, you know, drive up to it and fill up on some, on some mm-hmm. RO water. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, would just, the only thing I would just caution everybody is just to check the time. Last time it was serviced. And I would bring a small, cheap TDS pen with me, and it'll give you a good idea of where that machine is. You know, if you're reading 100 TDS, you probably know that machine hasn't been serviced in a while, and it's probably not good RO water. Yeah, that's a very good tip, and you'll probably look really crazy um, to the person next to you or in line as you're (laughs) trying to check this. (laughs) I mean, it costs you, what, 25 cents to get one gallon of water? If it's not great for your shrimp, then you have a gallon of water for yourself. Yeah, I wonder what they're, uh, I wonder what somebody behind you would think, like, you know, you're obviously not dressed in any type of uh, service equipment or uh, (laughs) a service mechanics outfit, and you're just this guy pulling out this, uh, you know, digital, what they probably think is a thermometer at some point. Um, yeah, yeah, that's got to be uh, that'd be interesting to see. I mean, the look I, on I lived face. off those machines for years. We would, I would fill up ten gallon, ten five gallon jugs every two weeks and lug them off into my car and drive them back up to my apartment, which was up on the second floor, and I had to lug them upstairs. Yeah, so let's say, um, let's say, all right, I, I start with that. I've got two tanks, but you know, I want to now transition to having an RO unit. So, what, mm-hmm. what is a decent? And I know, God, I say decent. I mean, that that could um, that is so subjective. But you know, in your opinion, what is a decent RO unit if I've got two or three, you know, ten gallon, uh, you know, tanks that require RO? So, kind of walk me through high level mm-hmm. what what I can expect to pay and um, just kind of what it entails to set up an RO unit. Sure. I mean, here's what I tell everybody when they're asking me about RO units. 
basically all the hardware, the basic hardware is pretty much the same on most kits. What you're really paying for are all the little connectors, maybe an extra um, unit itself, all the little gadgets that it comes with, like um, some have built-in TDS meters and, you know, some have flow restrictors and some have two membranes and you're paying, but you're really paying for is the actual filter units themselves, the quality of those units. So you can get a, a relatively cheap piece of hardware and maybe down the road you go and buy the actual higher end membrane or filter blocks themselves and put it into that cheaper hardware that you have now. So you can get you know, there are different RO units on the market. We've all seen them from, you can get from $60 to a couple hundred dollars, depending on how many stages of filtration you want. And so what would you say for, for kind of my setup, you know, to, to have healthy shrimp and not to go full bore and set up a breeding operation, but I want to give mm -hmm. them, you know, a nice, uh, a very comfortable existence that, you know, is comfortable enough for them to, to um, you know, promote some breeding um, so that I can trade with my local fish club members. Again, another plug, join your fish club. Um, <laughs> do, do I have to spend a couple hundred bucks or can I go down no. to the $60 unit and, and Am, am, am I maybe going to be okay? Because I do fully believe in you get what you pay for. Um, and right now I'm actually scrolling through a, a online retailer that shall not be named. And I'm seeing just a ton of RO units. And everything on here, all over the price, I mean, there's a lot of really good four- and five-star reviews on a lot of these. So um, mm -hmm. what do you, So I, I guess I could get one of these lesser expensive the units? I guess you start with, like, how hard your water is. If you have super, like, rock-hard water, you're obviously going to need – a unit that has more stages to it. If you're already starting with water that's, you know, not relatively rock hard, then you can save a few bucks and just get a cheaper unit. I mean, I see people asking about this unit called an RO Buddy all the time, and I see people recommend it all the time. I have no experience with that one. I have a nicer um, six-stage unit with two membranes and all kinds of filtration, but I'm making water all the time, so I want it to last longer also. Gotcha. Okay. And so then my last part of the question will be, um, where do I set this thing up? Um, for, for me, and when we finally got one at our old apartment, we actually put it underneath our kitchen sink. And then when I would want to make water, I'd pull out the hose and I'd connect it to the faucet. And that's how I made my water. And I would just collect it in a bucket. Now in, in our shrimp room, we have it permanently mounted to the wall and it, it's fed by the, the water line in our house. And now I have a couple 55-gallon drums of RO water at all times ready to go. You know, you can – some of these units are small enough. You can just throw them right on your counter and make water right there. You just get the faucet attachment and then a 5-gallon bucket and make some water in a couple hours. That's very cool, and that's good to hear because if you're, you know, if you're like me and you're walking a thin line with your spouse – on the number yeah. of, of <laughs> aquariums I mean, and there's some aquarium of these are small accessories. Enough, so you can totally hide it underneath your sink. You never see it. And they, like, there's a couple uh, different places that sell attachments that actually tap right into the water line. So you wouldn't even see that. And you just reach down and turn on the valve and make start making water. Just, you have to just hide your fish stuff all over the house <laughs> is, is what you have to do. I mean, the good thing about shrimp is they don't take up much space. This is true, and I, I have yet to come across somebody that is outside of the hobby that when they see either a Neocaridina or, uh, or some of these Caridinas, not think that they're cool. Right. Like, I think with right. the fish, you know, like, a, again, this is a, a, the primary topics of, of, my, of my show are, are about tropical fish, but of course, I mean, the, the shrimp is a huge portion of this. Um, I think some people can kind of pass, right? Like, you just kind of grow mm. up with this expectation. You see it in restaurants. Like, you just see mm. fish tanks, right? It's just a part of pop culture and just culture in a sense, but not the shrimp aspect of it. And so I have yet to see somebody walk by a tank with bright red shrimp in it or talk to somebody mm. and show them a picture of a, of a bright red shrimp or a bright blue shrimp and have them not be impressed, especially when they learn it's fresh water and it's something that they can keep at a relatively inexpensive price. Mm -hmm. And you can keep like a tank on a tank and hold hundreds of them, no problem. And, you know, they breed so prolifically that it's not like fish where the shrimp just constantly breeding. You're constantly, your colony's constantly growing. Yeah, they're making more. They're making more and they're cool. Yeah. And I mean, our, our local club, there's always people there bringing them and selling them. And then I know a couple of guys around here supply a couple stores. So who's your local club? Uh, we have a club called Scape. 
it's mostly planted tank guys, but a lot of the guys there are shrimp. Oh, very cool. So if you're in the, uh, you know, greater Los Angeles, Southern California area, um, that, is it open to the public or how does it work if uh, somebody wanted to check out a skate meeting? Um, anybody can come to a meeting. Uh, we do raffles at the meeting, so it's a five dollars into the raffle, and the money just goes right back to the club. It's a really good club. Like even they do raffles and auctions. Like I can bring stuff and put it in the auction. You decide, as me, as the person putting the item in the auction, you decide how much money goes to the club. Usually, it's twenty-five to fifty, or even a hundred percent of the the money generated in the auction goes to the club itself for running the club. There's no like no local businesses get the cut of it. It purely goes to the club. Yeah, that is uh, a really cool aspect of it. I definitely um, like. And the, then like, they, I, they I, use all that money they build every year. At the end of the year, they have one big um, meeting where they take all the money they've uh, gathered over the year and they go buy really nice stuff, like they buy ADA tanks or whatever, and then it gets raffled off to all the people who are members of the club. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so the the money just goes towards the actual members again and themselves. Yeah, so if you're in Southern California, uh, you wanna you wanna reach out to that group. And if do you guys have a web page or a Facebook page that I can put in the show notes? Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's uh, escape dot org, I think it is. Uh, I don't yeah. remember it off the top. No, no worries. Escapeclub dot org. Yeah, we can. Uh, we'll follow up on that after uh, yeah. po post production of this uh, this episode. Great club. They have monthly meetings. They're they're really a good club. That's how I, that's where I started. You know, I'm out here in LA. I met them and I started going to meetings and that's how I started buying stuff from Taiwan because I was supplying these guys. Yeah. Nothing better than getting with fellow fish nerds. It's a, it's a yeah. good time. All right, Eric. So you've, uh, you've shared some really good insight for people that uh, want to start uh, or that are maybe thinking about keeping Caradina shrimp. Um, so let's, let's talk about your, your disco B brand, right? So we kind of start, we talked about the origins of it. So what are you doing now? Um, what are, what are the products that you're offering? What are the services that you're offering? If you're offering any, um, just kind of walk us through what, uh, what your lineup is. So right now we're the North American rep and reseller of SL Aqua from Taiwan. Um, they're one of the biggest brands in the industry. They've won countless awards. He's a, the owner is a great friend of mine. I, that's how I I started using his initial product, which is the GH Blue Wizard, and then that's how I discovered them. I was using their product, and he started making more products, and I just kept following up with them, and then we became friends. And when I started the business, I was like, this is a no-brainer. I have to sell this stuff. This stuff is amazing. All right, so, so anyways, aside from a now really that, cool name, yeah. what is Blue Wizard? Uh, Blue Wizard is uh, GH, basically a GH remineralizer for RO water because Caradina and Neo Caradina both need GH in their water. Gotcha. So, okay, so if I want to keep Caradina, we talked about the RO water. So I'm, I'm, let's say I'm making my own RO water or I'm buying it. Um, RO essentially screens or pulls out all of the – um, the elements, right? All the impurities in the water, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. it's effectively just pure water, right? Yeah, it strips um, everything out of it. So, yeah. so now you're saying that we need to add something back into it. Yeah, which is why we start with our order, because now I'm in control of what I add back into it. I'm in control of where this water ends up. Gotcha. And so this, with... is, this is why I say, like, guys who come from the saltwater fish world or saltwater coral world have no problem in the shrimp world because they already understand how to manipulate water. Saltwater guys usually do really great in the shrimp world. Uh, and is uh, is Blue Wizard something that I dose every day, like a like a plant fertilizer, or is it something that's mm -hmm. kind of a one time when you're when you're actually adding it, uh, almost like a water conditioner, if you will? It's basically a water conditioner, is what it is. Yes, correct. You're you're mixing it to whatever GH number you want for that tank. And then you're adding it into the tank. Okay, so then that's not so scary then. I mean, everybody that's already keeping fish in the freshwater world, you're already used to using uh, Prime or whatever water conditioner of, ch of choice. Correct. This Correct. is just kind of, yeah. this is just that same idea. Well, this is that same uh, mechanic, if you will, but just for adding GH as opposed to uh, reducing your chlorine or chloramine or whatever the, the nasty yeah, yeah. things are. Yeah. Okay, Because cool. we're, we're using RO, which has nothing in it, so we need to put something in it or else... RO water is osmotic, and it's not really good for anything. Gotcha. All like right. Not even, it's not even good to drink RO water. Gotcha. So let's uh, – all right, so I cut you off there kind of mid <laughs> to, to go back right. and talk about Blue Wizard. So go ahead and uh, pick back up if you remember where you were. So we were um, – I forget now. <laughs> uh, you are uh, – your relationship with uh, SL Aqua? 
And uh, oh, so the it. owner I became friends with, and it was just a no-brainer for for me to start selling their product, and it just it was a great product. I stood by it. I used it for years before I started selling it, and it just made sense. So at this point, we've grown that brand to be huge in the U.S. It's known by pretty much everybody now. We need the best way we can we feel going forward to continue to grow the brand is to get it out there more. And for me to do that, I need to focus on getting it into more stores, into more, you know, resellers and et cetera, et cetera. Basically, I want to get more eyes on it rather than me being the only one. So going forward, we're we're transitioning to, we're going to start wholesaling SL exclusively. We're pulling back on retail of that, and we're going to try and get it in as many hands as we can. I know a lot of people are going to frown because they like buying it from me, but for us to continue helping grow this hobby, we feel this is the best way forward for us is to really focus on getting it into more hands and getting it into more tanks, basically, is what I want to do. And another part of this transition for us is retail is kind of taking the fun out of the game for me. It's not it's shrimp isn't as fun as it used to be when I first started. And I really want shrimp to be fun again for me. And I want it to be about the, the hobby and how fun it is to keep shrimp again for me. And so stepping a little bit away from retail is, is part of that. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, I guess my question before I, before I make a statement would be, um, so you will be a wholesaler. Uh, will people be able to then get SL Aqua from other online retailers or will that be exclusive to brick and mortars? Um, both. We're going to do online and brick and mortar. We've already been supplying a number of brick and mortar stores during this last few years. So that's, we're just going to, you know, extend that, but we're also putting it into the hands of some of the more popular online stores also. Okay, cool. And as far as, um, you know, what's your, uh, what's your brick and mortar saturation across the, uh, the United States? Uh, it's getting better. You know, I, I'm, this year we plan on making a lot of trips to actually these stores that we're already supplying. We want to do a lot of seminars and meetings and just get out there more. And that's kind of the fun of it for me. Like, it's more fun for me to be there and talk with people and, you know, shake hands and hug people and make friends than it is for me to make marketing commercials on Facebook all day. Yeah, and I think you know, from a from a business perspective, from in my opinion, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with pivoting what your business is, right? Um, you know, you, I just it, it, it just retail's really just gotten hard and not fun, and and I, and that's what I, that's what we got into this hobby for was because it's a fun hobby, and I want it to be about the shrimp and be fun again for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, you you have my support from somebody that understands that, you know, at times you need to change, you need to change your business model, you need to do things, you know, for the for the betterment of the brand and also for yourself personally. So, I mean, the right. fact and that I, for me to can to have fun again in this hobby, it's going to be I'm so excited. I'm already looking forward to it. And it's not I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to be a huge part of this hobby, and I'm still like going to you know, excuse my language here, but bust my ass to help grow it. Yeah, it's, it's Still, it, I mean, it's been around for, you know, 10 years in the USA, but it's still so new. It's still so niche. So let's talk about, will, will the, the discob.com then, will I be able to purchase other items on there? So SL Aqua, that's getting pulled. Will uh, it... the brand, All the products will still be, the information will still be on the website. You won't be able to purchase it there anymore, but you'll be able to see who carries it in your local fish stores or some of the online sellers. Um we don't want to take away the information from people. So I'm still going to leave all the information up there. Now I'm still going to keep the merchandise or, and I'm still going to keep the blog. I want to start blogging more. I want to start making it more fun again for myself. Yeah. You do have some really good articles on there that, um, you know, there's, I mean, a ton of resources, um, a ton of different articles that, you know, if this is something that you're even remotely interested in this, this hobby of keeping dwarf shrimp, um, you really want to go to discob.com, go to his art, go to Eric's article section, and just check out all these different articles that he has posted up. Um, and you, you'll spend hours of just you know taking in this content. Um, and I would challenge you, you know, coming out of reading even one or two of these articles, that uh, you know you're not going to walk away better informed. 
I mean, that's part of it. Like, I look at my article section, and I think it could be so much better and easier formatted and better to understand, and that's that's what I want to do. I want to make more knowledge easily available to everybody. And so you had mentioned merchandise. So let's uh, let's let's talk about your merchandise for a second. <laughs> so and and actually today. So what did I say today's date was April fourth. Um, I did yep. post um, a, a picture to my to the Aquarius podcast Instagram and Facebook. So if you're not already following either one of those, please jump on. Find me Aquarius podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I posted a picture of myself at work with the Seattle Space Needle in the background, and I'm wearing a Mariner's hat, but not just the Mariner's hat, though, with a T-shirt um, that is the Whoosh You Have Shrimp T-shirt. <laughs> and... well, let's talk about, like, where your coworkers <laughs> first thought of that first. <laughs> well, the, uh, I've got a couple goofy shirts. Like, I've got... Um, I have a pug, so I've got a couple of the the silly. It's by the mountain. Oh, yeah. the, the There's ma- a lot of those funny pug ones. The mountain brand, so it's a giant pug face. So I've I've worn that on like wear a wear a dog you know item day or, or something silly like that. Yeah. I, I work in a um, I work in you know kind of the tech environment, so it's very casual dress code. So uh, my my joking comment on social media was this is my uh, business casual attire, and it's you know, <laughs> Nike's jeans and a t-shirt and a ball hat, and you know obviously you see that I've got a full sleeve tattoo, so. Yeah. Um, not, yeah, not saying that I'm a badass because I have a tattoo or anything, but it's, it's very, very casual there. Um, so this is really like not that far outside of the norm, but the funny thing is, funny. is that most of them don't know about this Aquarius podcast. So, okay. you know, I'm maybe two and a half, three months in, depending on when this episode posts, um, into doing it. I'm having an absolute blast, but this is like this, this podcast for me is one of those things when, you know, for an icebreaker, you write down two things that are a lie and one thing that's true. If I wrote this down, I think everybody would think that's a lie. <laughs> They're like, you you do a podcast? What? Like, it, the few people that know, it kind of blows their mind. And so um, as I start to connect the dots for them, like, yeah, this is, you know, this is a guy I've connected with. He's real cool. He's got this business. And, um, you know, I just, I really like his, his t-shirt. And it's definitely in line with, you know, kind of the things that I already like. Um, but yeah, so, so this whoosh, you have, you have shrimp. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about this design. Like how did it come about? And, you know, I'll let so, you kind of describe it. So, so last year at, a, at a aquarium expo in Chicago, one of the guys that we shared a booth with wore some shirt. It's, it's a play on a meme that's already pretty popular. It's whoosh, you have, I forget what the actual final thing is. And he was wearing that shirt, and I was just cracking up all day because he was wearing it. And I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that, and I'm gonna make a meme that's, you know, shrimp related on that. I'm gonna play that up a little bit. So we took it, and I have a really good friend that's a graphic artist, and he's made actually a couple logos for the guys for other resellers. But anyway, he took it, and I was like, you know, let's let's concept this out a little bit and go with it. And and we came up with that idea, and I was like, it needs a gold chain. It needs a gold chain. <laughs> it's just so funny to me, and it it works really well. It actually works. Re- it's pretty funny looking, and I'm happy to see people wearing it. It always cracks me up when I see people wearing it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I you know you definitely you liked and you commented on the uh, on the Facebook post. So um, I hope you got a kick out of that, knowing that your uh, your shirt is getting represented in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's pretty funny. Like I, <laughs> those any of those T-shirts or any of that merch stuff, it costs me money, but I don't really care because it's funny to see people wearing that stuff. It's amazing to me that people want to wear that stuff. It's yeah, it's. Uh... <laughs> it's good times. Uh, and so, yeah, for people listening, I mean, this is obviously something that you need to go check out yourself. Uh, but to try to describe it, it's a it's a wizard gray, what is he, a tabby cat with a Mickey yeah. Mouse Fantasia kind of cap on, pointed cap. He's got a wand in his hand. He's got this Mr. T gold chain that says <laughs> Disco be on it. Um, and, uh, you know, he just waved his little wand. And, and here's this, uh, what is that, a crystal red or a crystal? Yep, crystal yeah. red. Yeah, yeah so he, and, and, and poof. There's a little crystal red. You can get it on a coffee mug. You can get a poster. Um, obviously, you've got, a, you've got a T-shirt. And what I really, really appreciate about this, um, and people are probably like, why are they still talking about a T-shirt? But I'm, <laughs> I'm passionate about swag and T-shirts. And for my work, when I travel around to our different facilities, um, each one kind of has its own brand and identity, and they get their yeah. own T-shirts. And so usually as a gift, the, the managers will give me a T-shirt for coming to their building. So I've got a whole bunch of, of swag. But what I like about you, your offering is that you can get the 50-50 blend which is i think the must have for t-shirts like no 100 oh, yeah. percent cotton Super soft and nice go with the 50 50 because they don't shrink they're just it's the way to go so get on there 
order a wushu have shrimp full disclosure you know you hooked it up i had to pay for shipping but you hooked me up with the t-shirt um if i ever make aquarius podcast t-shirts i will reciprocate i will send you one for free um so i gotta get you one of the all over print ones those ones are crazy (laughs) all over yeah we can do a uh, who wore it better with the uh, the male model that you have on there that's funny. Yeah, I mean, you can get a pillow of this thing. You've got the pillows. Yeah, you've got the, I was just the putting poster. like any product they have. I threw it on there. I'm like, here, go ahead, everybody. Yeah, so there's not, uh, you know, there's so far. I think mine's going to be the second, you know, actual like review picture. You've got yeah. a, another one of your customers yeah. that posted up a picture. So, um, yeah, you know, everybody listening to this, you know, even if you're, will it, will they ship international? I don't know. I could look into that. Uh, yeah, we, uh, if you're an international listener, which I know we have international listeners, so thank you for tuning in to, uh, to this show. Um, check this out. See if you can get your, uh, your Disco B shirt shipped internationally. I mean, this thing, you know, my, my post had said that this is probably the best shirt in the fish um, shrimp game out there. And there's some really cool uh, logos and T-shirts out there. But I think this one, mm-hmm. Eric, my, my hat's off to you and your graphic design buddy. Um, you know, and again, see, that's how passionate I am about merch and swag and t-shirts is that I took, you know, five minutes of, of our conversation just to talk about your t-shirt. So uh, the trend, I'm seeing the trend now, a lot of these people are making new logos and things. Everybody's using like a realistic shrimp on their logos now. And so many look the same to me. Yeah. And I mean, you've got this, you know, just kind of cutesy i don't want to say anime but it's uh it, it's cool it's, it works it's more of a few times over the years i'm still still flushing it out it's still not where i want it to be but it's getting there do you think you're going to incorporate a disco ball into uh, your uh, main our logo? original design back when we started had a disco ball on it i think you need to put up on your uh on your facebook maybe you've already done this but kind of a progression of your logo because i think that's uh, all put like the initial first drawings that we were sitting around the dinner table coming up with ideas yeah no i mean i think that's always fascinating like in business school seeing like the the iterations of different logos that companies went through um i i think that'd be an, that would make an awesome post is, is seeing you that's know the, funny. the various disco b um iterations yeah see this is the type of stuff i like this conversation i would love to just blog about stuff like this this is what i enjoy for them for, for me this is the fun part of the hobby <laughs> yeah this is no, this is and this is why I wanted to start this podcast. I mean, it's you know, I mean, well, I want to get good content and good information out there so people can better themselves as far as a, a tropical fish keeper. But um, you know, I, I have yet to really meet somebody, whether it's in person or in these phone calls, um, phone calls. I mean, these interviews um, that you know, just I haven't had a good time having a conversation with. And you mm-hmm. know, Eric, I'm definitely having a good time having a conversation with you. And I hope the listeners are also just enjoying our nonsense back and forth as we talk about this t-shirt and logos I mean, this is what happens at meetings if you go to a even if we in chicago at the aqua experience you know this is people who came to the booth i was just having a good time with them i didn't even want to look at products have at it but i'm rather here making friends and meeting everybody yeah i mean there's man there's so many conventions right now that i wish i could make it out to i missed um you know i didn't get a chance to, well I, I say didn't get a chance to i mean it's all the way on the other end of the country the the um, Northeast Aquarium, the Council of Aquariums, the NEC show. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the Orlando like Pet Trade Expo. There yep, was that, a, that was recently. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, and then upcoming, you've got a um, in May, you've got a Live Bear Association. You've got a Killy, the Killifish Association. I'm sure the uh, the Cichlid Association conference is coming up. So there's all these events I'm not going to be able to to go out to just because of you know family. Our big and, one, and, our big one is where the actual USA contest is at. It's in this year. They're doing it in New Jersey. So that's in mid, late October? Yeah, so that was actually going to be my next question to you. I'm going to try to at least make it out to that one. Um, it's a good time. It's fun just to hang out with everybody. That's what's fun to me. I, you know, I know, I've know, i known all some of these people for 10 years, and I only get to see them a couple of times a year, but I talk to them almost every day, all day long. Yeah, so I'm definitely going to try my best to uh, to make it out to that one. I've got some I've got some miles and some hotel points racked up from doing business travel, so um, I think. And this I, is the first year in New Jersey, so it should be a crazy time. Yeah, so uh, so are you going to have a booth then? Like, what what's yeah, your setup going to be like? The same people. Um, a group of us go in on a booth every year, and this year we kind of added a few more people, and we're trying to get an even bigger booth. Um, so it should be good. We're you know. All right, now if, I show, group of guys. now if I show up, will I get an opportunity to just kind of sit in your booth and hang out with you guys? 
Absolutely. Oh. You'd be surprised how many people do. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Because I don't want to show up for the weekend and just like walk around and nobody wants me to like sit there and hang out with them. And then I end up no, going no, to like. <laughs> it's the after show stuff, the dinners, the going out, the drinks later. That's the fun stuff where you're just hanging out and having a good time where the pressure of business is not on your back anymore. Yeah. I mean, talking with uh, yourself, Eric and Therese, just about the, the shrimp competition itself, you know, that, that, that's a reason why I need to get out there and actually see this yeah. in person and just see, you know, how awesome it is. And, and I want to say they're having, I, um, aquascaping. I think that's really good is I like, like you just said, you want to see it in person for people to see. It's one thing looking at photos on forums or websites or et cetera. But when you really get to understand how you understand is seeing the shrimp in person and getting a, a real idea of what it's a contest. So you're going to see really nice stuff. So you're going to see some really beautiful shrimp there. And it's, it's, you know, I can go on and on, but seeing the shrimp in person is so different than looking at photos online all day. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, not to, well, I guess it's kind of a, a spoiler alert, but, uh, or, or a, a hint or a teaser, I should say, um, you know, I think I'm going to have a dedicated episode coming up here, uh, just on the aquatic experience itself. So uh, any it's pretty little... cool. There's a little bit of everything there. Yeah, and that's what it sounds like. And I've really only you know covered so far over now. This would be kind of the third time I've talked about it. It's just the shrimp portion of it, but there's so much more that I want to make sure mm-hmm. that I cover leading up to it. Um, and I want to make sure that I that I get this particular episode out there within the next month or so. So, and when I say within the next month or so, before the end of May, because I want mm-hmm. you know listeners that maybe they're on the fence about it, like you know, assuming you don't live in New Jersey, right down the road from where the event will be, <laughs> or New York, um, that you know. Hopefully, I can help push you over the edge um, and get you to book a flight and book a, a reservation to go out there and enjoy the aquatic experience. So, I mean, stay- shrimp is just a small part of the entire show. It's huge. There's so much there. Yeah, and so that's uh, and again, that's what I hope to cover in that in that uh, you know sneak peek episode. So, it's just interesting. It's interesting to see like the first year there was really nobody like we didn't have a booth and there was no really shrimp vendor booth or anything like that. And then the next year that we had a booth and there was one other person and it's been slowly growing. And I guess they're the, the organizers are excited that shrimp is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I, I, I hope uh, a lot of the times I talk about, you know, things that will help uh, get youth in, into the hobby and things that will help grow the tropical fish hobby. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I've pointed to, you know, hopefully, you know, what I, what I like to think is that, you know, this, um, emergence of, uh, keeping these, these really cool shrimp, um, will help get more and more people into the hobby where, you know, maybe they weren't interested in keeping a goldfish or a guppy tank or a cichlid tank, but, you know, a little 10 gallon planted tank with some, with some shrimp in it is right up their alley. Mm-hmm. I'm actually working on a coworker right now. I'm trying to talk him into a Fluval spec five. Um, <laughs> I've just, uh, I've showed him a handful of pictures and I'm trying to convince him to, uh, to pull the trigger on it and, uh, mm-hmm. and set it up. He's using all these excuses about not having spaces in his apartment. And I'm like, man, you've got, you've got, it's like a 12 by 12 foot. Exactly. I think it's, I, I think it's less than that. I think it's like seven by 12. I'm like, man, yeah. you, you can fit it. So, uh, hopefully, fit I, ho- kitchen counter. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I can have an update. And I think he lives pretty close to our building, um, his apartment. So I might even throw in like a free maintenance contract. Like, all right, like two, <laughs> That's funny. you know, two times a month I'll come out and, and service your tank for you. All right. Free of charge. That's a, a little Aquarius I, it was podcast interesting special. Last year, because our booth, we had some really, really high end shrimp there. Um, and then we were selling them right at the booth, but it's, it's, it's one thing when people walk by and they're like, wow, those shrimp are amazingly beautiful. But then I think there was a lot of sticker shock at the same time, which maybe didn't, wasn't the best idea for beginners to see, but you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's just, yeah, that's just going to happen. If you, if you don't but know. I, we were all really good about explaining like, Hey, this is, you know, top of the line. This is your Porsche versus, you know, Honda Civic over there. <laughs> yeah. Which your, your Honda Civic is still pretty cool. Yeah. All right, so I mean, it's amazing that like shrimp prices have dramatically decreased. I remember paying a oh, well over two hundred dollars for one Black King Kong Caradina Taiwan B. Now you can get, you know, a pack of twelve to fifteen for under a hundred dollars, which is crazy to me. One for two hundred dollars. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah. That I is. Mean, that was when there was only two two importers at the time. 
Wow. And that was the prices. That was because they were all new. It was sort of new, and that's was, that was what we paid. So everybody listening that you know has never kept Caradina before but may venture into it, you can thank the early adopters like Eric and all these <laughs> other guys out there for – um, helping to drive down the cost, you know, by breeding and and uh, and doing their doing their part in the hobby to help, uh, you know, spread these shrimp around so that the price can be lowered. Um, and, and so I, I think this is kind of a good segue into um, since we're kind of talking, uh, we're on this, you know, kind of econ shrimp 101 topic of mm-hmm. you know joining the USA Freshwater um, Shrimp Group on Facebook. You know, it seems like everybody on there is setting up a breeding tank. And so one of the immediate mm-hmm. questions for me, like my, my undergrad education is in economics. And so kind of what, I, what I automatically go to is what is the actual market for the shrimp? Um, who are the customers and are we just kind of, um, I, I guess, where are we in the market with shrimp? Who are the, like I said, you know, I'm repeating myself now, but who are the customers? Um, mm-hmm. and, and are we just, are shrimp breeders, buying and selling to other shrimp breeders in hopes that eventually like the public will step up and start ordering from them as well. Yeah, I think you're you're not too far off on there on that target where it's super niche in the USA. You know, in the US we like everything bigger and shrimp are smaller. You know, we want big and powerful. We want big dogs. We want, you know, big cars. It's it's super niche in the USA. We're probably the USA is probably, you know, ten five years behind, like Taiwan or Japan or China in this hobby. They're they've been doing it for a lot longer than us. So you know, it's it's still really niche here. It's grown quite a bit for sure in the last few. Like I said, the prices of things have come down. I mean, now is a great time to be getting into this hobby because. Caradina prices are as cheap as I've ever seen. They're almost on par with Neo Caradina at this point. So, what are your thoughts on on this kind of this this thought of mine? Um, there's some pretty popular YouTube videos out there of breeding breeding shrimp, breeding fish for profit. All right, and mm-hmm. so um, you know some some pretty well established names have put these videos out. They're incredibly popular. They've received a lot of views. Um, mm-hmm. Are people watching those videos and going, yeah, you know, that's something I could do? They're finding various websites of, of some of you, you know, more old school guys that, that already have your breeding system set up and you're able to kick out um, and supply demand. And, and these new people that have watched the video are thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and buy those shrimp. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in this investment and then I'm going to be a breeder and then I'm going to sell shrimp. But who is their outlet? I guess. I mean, are they? Are the, do you do you know of people that are actively pursuing uh, their local fish stores to be their outlet? Are they trying to move shrimp on Craigslist? Are they trying to sell to other breeders? And, and I'm asking all these questions, uh, you know. And I'm not trying to, to dissuade anybody from getting into this if they want to, or to you know make people second guess their decision to set up a shrimp breeding room. I think it's wonderful, and I think what's wonderful mm-hmm. about this is even if you don't have this amazing you know funnel to get your product out there you can still at least enjoy it where if you Mm -hmm. invested in fidget spinners and you have a garage full of fidget spinners that i'm going to assume is not enjoyable where at least if you set up a shrimp room that's still really really cool like you know i know you have intentions of making money to help pay for the the hobby whether you want to make just profit out the wazoo or you just want to cover your electricity and water expenses and to be able to sustain itself um, mm-hmm. you can still really enjoy your, your product, right? Even when you're not selling mm-hmm. it and granted you have to take care of it, but it's not mm-hmm. a bunch of fidget spinners in a box in the garage. That's funny. Yeah. I think like there's a lot of guys that supply their local fish stores or go to their local club meetings and trade with trade shrimp for plants kind of thing, or just become the guy at their local club that knows the most about shrimp. And when people at their local club start getting the bug, they're the guy there, you know, Yes, the market is, I guess, if you join, like, a forum that's for shrimp, obviously that's going to be a saturated market. But if you become the, you know, the big fish in the little sea, you're going to be the guy at your local club who has all the shrimp. Like, for me, I'm just happy that Disco B pays for itself in the long run. It's purely a hobby for me. Everybody knows that it's not my day job not paying all my rent for me it's i'm just happy that it pays for itself and we get to travel around to meet shrimpers all around the world 
And, and do you see? Your, are are you going to offer? Um, like, are you going to set up breeding and 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 sell to you know people on forum groups or to your local club or um, where do you see your personal shrimp um, collecting going? We we've been selling personally for a number of years. We used to import back when shrimp were a very high value, and at some point they dropped to a value where we decided that importing wasn't worth it anymore. We to import now, you have to import thousands and thousands and thousands of shrimp to for it to pay off. We decided that's not for us anymore. We're just going to breed, you know, the, what do I have now, 15 to 20 tanks at any given time. That's all we're going to do. And I sell, you know, to a number of guys on the group, and I sell to local fish stores, and I just kind of keep it, you know, low-key to, for myself and, you know, if you're really looking for something in particular, I'm happy to help you find it. Even if it's not me that can supply it and I can recommend somebody else that has it, it's fine. I, I recommend people all day long, even if it's a product. Like you say you don't want an SL product and you want some other brand name product, I'll tell you where to get it. don't matter to me. I'm just happy to see that you're growing in the hobby. Yeah, I can personally attest to that. I've I've seen um, from yourself and, and numerous other individuals on the USA Freshwater Shrimp and Plants group um, where somebody asks a question, hey, who's got the best this or where can I get that? And, you know, mm -hmm. you guys jump in and you're like, oh, this guy, you know, this girl, she's, mm -hmm. she's got the best or he's I try got to, the best. I try and... to keep up with the people who have, what, who have breeding rooms going on and understand what they have. And so I know, like, if somebody's asking for something, I'm like, oh, I know this guy has it. You know, I, I, that's, I'm happy, like, to recommend to anybody, really. It just the, my only thing is I'm not going to recommend something that obviously isn't, you're not going to have a good experience with. So that's it. I just want to see the hobby grow. And so if you have a good experience and you continue in this hobby and you buy more shrimp, you expand, you become one of these small home breeders, great. I'm excited for that. I just want to see it just keep going and going. I want to see, like, the the thing, I know I've said this before to a lot of people, but here's the thing with shrimp sales. These Taiwan breeders are breeding these amazing, high-end, very expensive shrimp, and 99% of their sales are going to mainland China or Japan. These guys are willing to pay the top dollar for the high-end shrimp. So... Say you're, Randy, say you're a, a shrimp breeder who's breeding very high-end stuff. Let me give you a scenario of who would you rather sell to. Would you rather sell to somebody who flies to your shop, pays you top dollar in cash, and then takes the shrimp home? Or would you rather deal with a person who doesn't speak the same language as you, most often probably the case, a lot of them is not, a lot of them do speak English now, though, who doesn't speak the same language as you, wants the cheapest price you can get and you have to ship it halfway around the world, which is going to be your, you know, go-to sale. That's, that's a tough choice, but I think I'm going to have to go with the former on that one. Yeah. The cash, <laughs> take it home. I don't have to do anything. You just come here and get it and pick the ones you want. Right. So this is the problem with why the U S is so far behind. So all the good shrimp are going to other countries and we're getting because the USA wants, you know, the best value we can get on anything, it's just part of business, we're getting, not to say this in a bad way, but we're getting leftovers, really. You know, nine out of ten of those good shrimp are going to other countries, and that one left is not the greatest, probably. That's why he's left. And so USA is getting leftovers, basically. The, the, it's, it's, it's a weird market. Like, obviously, we want to give you the best price on a shrimp. But at the same time, it, it there is some cost in doing business. At the same, you know what I mean? Like, it, importing shrimp is not cheap. No, you have I, to I import thousands to get all the fees, the shipping, the customs, et cetera, et cetera, covered. Well, I would say culturally as well, and you know, I think you alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, the Chinese and the Japanese culturally value and have valued the decorative. Like you take, right. you take koi, koi and goldfish. Yeah. They have yep. always placed a higher value on those. Um, and I would say a larger swath of the population where in America, I don't, I don't think we've had the same, if you want to say per capita, I don't think we've had the same 
interest and value mm-hmm. per capita in those ornamental fish um, than they have. Koi is a great example of it. Yeah, and, great example. And, and I would think it would naturally extend to to shrimp as well. And um, you know, I would say to some to, to an untrained eye that's getting into this, uh, you know, they may struggle with, hey, I want a beautiful planted tank. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't care which plants are in there. I want them to do well. I want it to be beautiful mm-hmm. and I want shrimp. Um, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that red neocaridina red cherry shrimp. Cause it's two or three bucks a pop versus you right. know, the $50 one. So, yeah. And, and you know, I mean, you lead me down this other thing where a lot of people come in wanting to do beautiful planted tanks, all scaped very nicely. And then they want to have shrimp in there, which is great. But I always tell people, you kind of got at some point you're kind of going to pick you want to pick a focus either you're all about the planted beautiful escape tank or is shrimp your focus is shrimp your focus you'll see that as people become more involved with shrimp their tanks actually become less like stocked with plants cuz you want to enjoy the shrimp more so you need to be able to see them more so shrimp people usually have a few basic plants and that's really it cuz we want to see the shrimp I mean, gold, the koi thing is a great example. I like that example. Yeah, and so I, I think you know we're we're um, maybe we're catching up in the in the koi area. I I, I doubt it. Um, I think <laughs> we, we probably have a decent koi market, but nothing compared to Japan or China. Um, I think all things, f- in, in, you know, in finery, if you will, China has just become an absolute monster. Um, mm-hmm. Some of some of the cigar and, and pipe tobacco podcasts that I listen to, again, like listeners know that I love all types of podcasts, and you know, those are a couple of my interests. And I know that in the Chinese market, there is a strong demand for premium, high end, super high end um, cigars and pipes, like you know, these pipe carvers that carve these absolutely gorgeous pieces of. of of, of work from their hands, you know, they're selling for, uh, two, three, four thousand dollars for custom, custom carved by an American, um, a a lot of American, uh, excellent pipe carvers in America. Yeah. I was just going to ask where are those coming from? Like there, there's a guy in uh, San Diego that I listened to. Um, I've checked out his website as well. I mean, they're, they're all over the country, but these guys are just absolute, you know, wizards with, with wood and carving. And these are functional pipes and there's a, there's a huge demand for those in China. So I think China will always outcompete us in the mm-hmm. um, conspicuous consumption realm, where <laughs> if they can <laughs> if they can spend more of that wealth uh, to to flash it, I think they will. And I, it's just I think it's just hard to be an importer for shrimp. It's you really got to work hard. And Neo Caradina have such a stigma with them about being carrying diseases, and everybody wants low prices and. You know, shrimp now are at the lowest price it's ever been. So you're literally selling volumes of shrimp just to make that dollar. Versus some of the old school importers who are no longer in this hobby, they didn't have to worry about that. They were importing a you know thousand shrimp at a time, and they were going for a couple hundred bucks each. They were doing pretty well back then. Now you got to, you got to be a person with a warehouse filled with tanks. That's the only way you can do it. Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see where we are, and you know, in the next couple of years, um, you know, talking about market saturation, talking about you know the number of breeders that are getting into it, um, mm-hmm. and then our tastes as you know home aquarists, um, you know, mm-hmm. have we have we been able to you know support this increase in the number of people that are setting up fr- fish or uh, shrimp breeding rooms and in mm-hmm. large um, fish where or shrimp I keep saying fish shrimp warehouses <laughs> to just import and breed and, and mass produce these really mm-hmm. cool shrimp um, you know is the demand at the end of the day going to be there when all of the market entrants that are that want to breed have gotten into the game and everybody has their breeding stock is the public it- is there going to be enough aquarist demand in the public non-breeding arena to support Mm -hmm. their investment and i hope the answer is yes i really do i think that really comes back to it's our it's in our hands we have to go share this hobby and educate people and you know make it fun for them yeah exactly yeah everybody can have a shrimp room breeding shrimp but if there's no demand like you say then what's where are we going to go with it yep yep we got to get uh got to get shrimp tanks in the hands of the kids and not uh not iphones right right and that's, that's kind of partly why we're making this transition. Like, I want it to be fun again, and I want to be out there doing things. I don't want to have to worry about, oh, i got to go home after working 10 hours a day and do two hours of boxing up orders. That's not That kind of took away the fun of the hobby for me. 
Yeah, Eric. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you said that uh, you've enjoyed our conversation. I, I, you know, you said that midway through. I hope you you've still enjoyed it uh, all the way up to this point. Um, I, I truly hope that the the listeners at home have enjoyed it and have picked up some good tips on. Um, you know, where they can go to get additional information on your website, uh, the Mm -hmm. Facebook group, all of that stuff we'll have in the show notes. Um, I'm very, very grateful for you taking time out of your evening to to talk with me. And and like I said, I I hope it was enjoyable for you. And I hope this is, you know, just one more thing on your path to, to enjoying the hobby again. Absolutely. I love talking shrimp. I, we have locals stop by our house all the time and we just hang out in the shrimp room and talk shrimp for hours on hours. Yeah, well, I mean, at the rate I'm going with having a a weekly show, you know, I'd I'd like to have you back on, and you know, in a few months, and we'll we'll reconnect and maybe talk about a different subject or just see where you are and how the uh, how the wholesale business is working for you. Great, Eric. Thank you very much for uh, being on the Aquarius Podcast. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Randy. All right, have a good night. Thank you again to Eric Martins for a great interview. Check out the in-depth content Eric has put together on DiscoB.com and take your shrimp game to the next level. That does it for this episode, so get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.